Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Talk Math with Your Friends. Our speaker today is Dr. Asmita Sodi. Dr. Sodi is a postdoc at Dalhousie University, and today she will be talking about the mathematics of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. So will everyone please join me in welcoming Dr. Sodi. Hello, thank you everyone. Um, I have the chat on my screen, so I will be able to see if you put anything in the chat. However, I am one of those people who like finds it really distracting to look at the chat sometimes. So if I don't um, acknowledge your thing right away and I've missed something, BK, please do uh, draw my attention to it. So as Tian said, my name is Asmita, um, and at this precise moment, I'm a postdoc at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and Canada. And I know there's at least one person here who's in my weird time zone, not weird, not as weird as the time zone we are both from, actually, because Neil and I are both from Newfoundland. Um, I defended my PhD in week two of the world shutting down and have gone from being a faculty to postdoc to maybe faculty in winter again. As I said, I have an interview tomorrow, so I'm at a weird uh, intermediate stage post PhD. Um, I'm talking about Alice today, but my PhD research was in algebraic number theory, um, specifically rings and polynomials. Uh, and my postdoc work right now is actually in graph theory, so I guess I do that now too. Um, but the thing that makes me the most excited really is math education and math outreach. And this talk that I'm giving today is based on one I gave a few years ago for a Nova Scotia Math Circles outreach event. Um, let's make sure the clicker's working. There we go. Okay, before we get into the talk, there are a few things that I'd like to acknowledge. So first, I'd like to acknowledge that I live, work, and play in Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'm still coming to understand what role I, as a settler and math educator, am to play in reconciliation, and I'm really grateful for all the conversations that are being had in the Canadian math education community lately about math decolonization and reconciliation, which have been giving me so many opportunities to listen and learn. Secondly, today is Remembrance Day in Canada, which I understand is observed in a slightly different way than Veterans Day in the United States. This is something I learned yesterday when I was looking it up. Um, it's a day of solemnity and uh, remembering, and I'm about to give a talk that's not very solemn. Um, so thank you for in advance for sharing this hour with me and allowing me to be a bit nonsensical today. And thirdly, the mathematical story I'm going to tell you today is exclusively white and male, and no one in this presentation looks remotely like me. Um, one could argue that this is a sign of the historical times in which we'll be bringing ourselves back to, um, but we also know that women were being actively excluded from mathematics during this era. Um, for example, Sophie Germain, was, who had to masquerade as a Mr. Leblanc in order to attend the École Polytechnique, um, she died the year before Lewis Carroll was born. Um, at the same time, contributions to mathematics were undoubtedly being made by people around the world who were Black, Indigenous, or people of color, um, people who the white men of the 19th century may not have been willing to call mathematicians as they perpetuated their exclusionary culture of mathematics. Um, so, for example, Ramanujan was born 11 years before Carol died. We all probably are a bit aware of some of the difficulties Ramanujan faced in having his mathematics being accepted by people in the UK. Um, while today the math world is becoming more diverse, there are still people being excluded or pushed out of the field and there's still work to be done. So I just wanted to acknowledge those few things before um, we get into the real thing that we're going to do today, which is talking about Alice. So I wanted to give a bit of context into how um, Alice in Wonderland became such an important part of my life, um, because I realized like as I was writing this talk, I kept unearthing memories that were like really dug back in my mind from when I was a small child that I completely forgot about. Um, so like any good child born in the 1990s, my introduction to this children's classic was via the Hello Kitty version of Alice in Wonderland, which my parents recorded from TV onto VHS and I watched a lot. And I will send out the slides at the end. And if you click on Hello Kitty, you too can watch the Hello Kitty version of Alice in Wonderland. Um, so I, I have that like ready for you. <laughs> Um, as I was writing this talk, as I said, I unearthed some other early memories of my introduction to Alice in Wonderland. My dad had this metal pencil case with Alice and the Cheshire Cat on it that I was just like in love with. I saw someone mention the Disney version. I actually didn't see that until I was 18 um, because I took a children's literature course, but I'll get to that. Um, and my hometown actually was also, um, uh, it's 
It was home to a poetry festival that uh, ran from 1988 to 2018 that was called um, the March Hare. So part of this festival had a event for children called the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. And so I used to go to this Mad Hatter's Tea Party when I was a small child. Um, it was used loosely affiliated with the university where my dad taught. And in fact, one of the storytellers who would tell stories at the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, um, her husband was a math professor at the university. Um, so one of my dad's colleagues, because my dad was also a math professor, and that storyteller and her husband retired to Halifax. And I actually ran into um, the math professor like a month ago in a bookstore. I hadn't seen him since I was 14. Um, so that's just a nice little like string through my life of Alice. Um, I finally got the book um, for my birthday when I was 10. And I actually very distinctly remember um, writing on my calendar because I wanted to see how long it would take me to read the book. And I think I read it in 10 days. So I was like really on top of this stuff. And as I mentioned, I took a children's literature class in my first year of university and got to read the text for school. And that's when I finally saw the 1951 um, Disney film, which I'm not a huge fan of personally, because I started out with Hello Kitty and that's just like much nicer and I think truer to the story as well. Um, I also included this image because um, I am a big, uh, yes, downhill from Hello Kitty, completely agree. Um, I included this image because um, I'm a big fan of ballet. I danced for several years and the Royal Ballet and National Ballet of Canada commissioned a ballet of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which is choreographed by Christopher Wielden. Um, it premiered in 2011. It is a wonderful ballet. If you have an opportunity to see this, I really recommend it. The stage production is like incredible. Um, it is one of my top two ballets that I have seen with my own eyes, like in real life. I saw this in 2015 and again in 2019, and it's just absolutely one of my favorites. I included the Cheshire Cat because it's my favorite part of the ballet. You can kind of see that there seem to be people like holding the bits of the Cheshire Cat, and so they move all the way around, and it's um, and it's just wonderful. It's magical. Um, and in 2015, for the 150th anniversary of Alice, um, this book, which is Alice's Adventures in Wonderland Decoded, was published. Um, you might be familiar with the annotated Alice by Martin Gardner, which was published in 1960. I actually haven't really read that one, but this Alice in Wonderland Decoded is also a really nice book um, that I recommend. And I have a list of references and that book is there. Um, so that's just a bit of like how Alice has been a string throughout my life, um, much like Paddington Bear, but the less math with it. Um, so Charles Litwich Dodson was born in Cheshire in Northwest England and came from a family of Church of England clergy. And also as if I was destined to love Alice, my birthday is actually um, Dodson's death anniversary. <laughs> so that is something that I always remember. He died on uh, the same day of the year that I was born. Um, of obviously many years later uh, for me. Uh, Dawson received a first class um, degree in mathematics in 1852, and he was subsequently awarded a fellowship at um, the, uh, oh, sorry, at um, Christchurch College um, with a salary of 25 pounds a year for life. Um, so things were very, very different in Oxford in Victorian times. Um, part of this fellowship involved him taking holy orders and remaining celibate, also a part of being at Oxford in this era. Um, and as a result, he was ordained as a deacon in the Church of England in 1861, and he continued to teach at Christchurch until 1881. Um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was published in 1865 and Through the Looking Glass in 1871. So while he was being a lecture in mathematics at Oxford and in his career there. I wanted to introduce you to some of the mathematics that he was interested in. So his work was primarily in geometry, logic, linear algebra, and also recreational mathematics. He actually published several books on these topics. Um, he was also interested in studying voting methods, which is another topic I find, find very interesting. I did an outreach talk on that in September. Um, Dodson brought some of his wit into his mathematical work, as well as his stories for children, um, writing in Euclid and his modern rivals about the ghost of Euclid returning to defend his work to modern, at the time, geometers. Um, Dodson wrote this play as a defense of using Euclid's elements as a way of teaching geometry because he did not like the new geometry books that were being used in schools and just like loved Euclid so much. So he wrote a play about it. Um, these are both links. So if you're interested in reading Euclid and his modern rivals, I've got you covered um, when I when I uh, leave at the when I give you the slides at the end. Um, 
He also did a lot of work in mathematical logic, and he wrote a book called The Game of Logic to represent proportions or propositions, sorry, and inferences using a board game. And um, I don't think it's a very fun game. Admittedly, there's also a book like you can look at that. It's very confusing. Um, I actually did a talk on some of Dodgson's work in logic at an undergraduate math conference back in 2013, um, but the talk slides seem to have been lost in the sands of time. I was going to try and um, look back on them, but I think that they like didn't make it to the computer I bought in grad school and they're back on the laptop that I had as an undergrad. Um, Dodgson also published some more formal books on logic that were not meant as confusing games for children. So like actually for people to understand logic and not necessarily like moving coins around a diagram. It's very confusing. I recommend looking at it just because it's such a, a different way of thinking about logic. Um, but it was meant for children. I don't think they would have enjoyed it. I know my audience when I talked about this in 2013 also did not think children would enjoy it. Um, so before we actually get into the story of Alice, this is my last slide before we get to Alice, um, I want to talk about some of the mathematics that was happening at the time. Um, yes, it was symbolic logic. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, so Dodgson was born just before the Victorian era. So um, he was born in 1832. Um, Queen Victoria's reign started in 1837 and continued to 1901. Um, so as we enter Wonderland and progress through the story, we're going to see some of these ideas pop up. I have started slightly before the Victorian time, just because it's things that are going to come up and before Dawson was born, because there are things that are going to come up in, uh, in Wonderland when we get there. So in 1822, Paul Lasse published a treatise on projective geometry, which was foundational to the field. Um, in 1827, Mobius first introduced the homogeneous coordinates used in projective geometry. Um, 1843, William Rowan, Rowan Hamilton discovered quaternions and the fact that they're non-commutative. Uh, 1847, Boole formalized symbolic logic. And in fact, um, the symbolic logic book that Paul just mentioned, um, that was the first layperson text um, for, about symbolic logic. So that was written by Dodgson. So he's really into um, presumably the work of Boole since he was so interested in symbolic logic. Um, in 1854, Cayley showed that quaternions can represent rotations in force space. The Mobius strip was invented in 1858. In 1874, Cantor proves that the real numbers are uncountably infinite and that the algebraic numbers are countably infinite. And, um, and the Klein bottle is invented in 1882. So you, as you can see, there are a lot of big ideas happening um, that we continue using now with projective geometry and quaternions and then um, those kind of more ma mind-blowing math things that we like to use uh, as tricks like um, the Mobius strip or the Klein bottle or the fact that like there's different kinds of infinity another very confusing idea at first um, that we can make use of. So there were a lot of new things happening in this time um, that might have inspired um, Dodgson in his writing of Alice. And just, I, I'm really sorry that the timeline is not actually linear. This is what PowerPoint does. It bothers me that the times are inconsistent. Well, so right here is where around here is where Alice was published. So a couple of these things came afterwards, but I just wanted to show um, what was kind of happening at the time um, to give an idea. So um, before getting into the story, we're almost there. I should also say the following, which is that Dodgson never spoke about the mathematics in Alice in Wonderland, which means that all the obs observations that I'm going to talk about in this talk are just like, like how I feel about literary analysis in general, speculation of what people think the author meant or intended and not them actually saying what was intended. I know I struggle with literary analysis. Um, my cousin-in-law has a PhD in English and she probably wouldn't like to hear me say that, but uh, that's okay. Um, so we might be finding math in the story because we're actually looking for it rather than it being there implicitly by the author. But I'm not sure that that's necessarily such a bad thing if we can interpret some things that were maybe not intended to be mathematical as being mathematical. Um, I'll also say that keen observers might know that this illustration is actually from Through the Looking Glass. It's not from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Um, we'll only be talking about Alice's Adventures in Wonderland today. And I'm going to punctuate our journey with um, John Tenniel's wood engraved illustration. So these are some of the, um, I think there were 42 original wood engraved illustrations that John Tenniel made for the first publication of the book. They're really beautiful illustrations, so I've put them throughout. Um, we're going to kind of walk through the story 
of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and take some pit stops to talk about some mathematics. So that's the plan. So I will also be reading you um, parts of the story as we go, because I do so love reading out loud. Um, so first we're going down the rabbit hole. Alice is sitting outside with her sister when suddenly a white rabbit wearing a waistcoat rushes by and hops into a rabbit hole. Alice decides to follow the rabbit and finds herself falling for a very long time until she lands in a passageway. She sees the white rabbit and continues to follow him, but loses him and ends up in a half, a hall, sorry, full of locked doors. She finds a key to a very tiny passage and wishes that she could shut up like a telescope so that she could fit inside. She is tempted by food and drink labeled eat me and drink me and finds herself changing sizes. So after falling down the rabbit hole, Alice is very confused and wonders if she has turned into one of the other children she's friends with. So in order to check whether she has turned into one of them and is not actually still herself, um, she wants to check that she knows the things that she used to know. So she tries to recite her times tables. Alice is seven, so this is interesting to me <laughs> that she's already on multiplication, but you know, power to Alice. So Alice is, um, is reading or is reciting her times tables and says, let me see, four times five is 12 and four times six is 13 and four times seven is, oh dear, I shall never get to 20 at that rate. This might seem nonsensical how Alice is doing her multiplication, but there's actually some logic behind it. And um, this is where I might have more participation from you. You're welcome to write on some of the slides in a moment. Um, so what if Alice's products are not being represented in base 10, but in some other base? So Alice said that four times five is 12, which we know in base 10 uh, to be 20. But for what n is 20 base 10 the same as 12 base n? I invite you to, um, I would write on my own board, but I have things like set up so I can't actually do it. So if anyone would like to annotate in order to calculate what we have here. So remembering that when I'm talking about 20 base 10, what I'm saying is I have zero copies of one and two copies of 10. And I add those together and get 20. So now when I'm looking at base n, I want to have two copies of one and one copy of n and for that to be equal to 20. So there we go. BK has said, and Joel have said 18. Wonderful. I am what not about... able to annotate the screen. That's probably oh, okay. Why okay, that's fine. We can do it in the comments. That works too. Um, similarly, Alice said that four times six is 13. So for what base N is 24 base 10, the same as 13 base N? People might not have expected that I was actually going to make them do arithmetic today, but. <laughs> 21, perfect. Thanks, Neil. Um, so, oh, there we go. Alice's multiplication tables seem to be going, like I know that when we only have two things, we can't actually discern a pattern from them, but let's just, we're in Wonderland, we're being a bit nonsensical today. Let's just assume that we can discern a pattern from this. So it looks like Alice's multiplication tables are of the form four times, let's say five plus K is 12 plus K for K greater than or equal to zero. So each time Alice goes up one, one step in her multiplication, the answer also goes up one step. If we assume this pattern, what happens if we keep going? So I have a bunch more. Um, if you would like to divide and conquer for these, or I can just, I'll, I'll let you think about this to, to discern the pattern just to get more than two data points. <laughs> if you would like to look and try to do the pattern. There we go, BK's got it. So the first one is um, for every single one, we're going up by three for our N. So we have um, four times seven, it'll be 14 mod N or 14 base N when N is 24. The next one's 27, 30, 33, 36, 39. So just doing a little bit of calculation, maybe that's very obvious as well in the way that we're doing our arithmetic that this is what's going to happen. So Alice had said um, when she was worrying about her multiplication, I shall never get to 20 at this rate. So if we had that four times 13, which would be the next thing in our pattern was equal to 20 base N, then N would be 26, which then wouldn't fit our plus three pattern. 
Um, so something goes wrong when we get to 20. And what we wanted based on our pattern that we found was to have um, 20 in base 42, which is actually 84, so four times 21. So all of a sudden, Alice has had to jump from four times 12 to four times 21 to get where she wants to go. So Alice is right. It's going to take her a while to get to 20. She has to go all the way up to her 21 times tables. Um, this little discovery was actually made by Alexander Taylor in his biography of um, Lewis Carroll or Charles Dobson um, called The White Knight, uh, which was published 50 years after Carroll's death. So again, this is all like the speculation of whether this was intended or not, but it is really interesting that this pattern ends up happening, that it is hard for Alice to get to 20. Um, and so maybe there is some thought put in there. So now Alice has determined, well, she hasn't actually concluded whether she's still herself or not because she couldn't do her multiplication tables that she knew. Um, and so she's very upset that she doesn't know who she is and bursts into tears. She begins shrinking again and slips into what she thinks at first is the sea, but is actually the pool of tears she cried when she was very tall. She meets a mouse and as the pool fills up with, the other, up with other animals, um, they all swim to shore. After swimming in the pool of tears, Alice and the animals are all very wet and the dodo that is with them suggests a caucus race to dry, dry off. What is a caucus race? Asks Alice. The caucus race is a haphazard race in which everyone starts and stops whenever they like and the race ends whenever the dodo says so and everyone wins. But I wanna talk about another kind of race which is Zeno's paradox of Achilles and the tortoise. So Achilles, the world's fastest man, is riding, racing against a tortoise. Once the tortoise has reached point A, Achilles starts running. By the time Achilles reaches A, the tortoise is at B. By the time Achilles reaches B, the tortoise has moved to C. And since this progress goes, process goes on forever, Achilles can never beat the tortoise. So Zeno was Lewis Carroll's favorite philosopher, and Carroll actually wrote a dialogue um, about logic, which he published in the philosophical journal Mind in 1895 using the characters of Achilles and the tortoise. So this was long after Alice, about 30, I guess 30 years after Alice was, uh, was published um, and just a few years before uh, Dawson died or Carol, I referred to him in both ways. I thought I had got all the places where I'd written the Carol. Alas. Um, anyway, he, he was really interested in this and, and actually wrote a dialogue, which again, have linked. You can read it. It's very, very short. Um, and he, in this dialogue, in um, the story that was written, Achilles is caught up to the tortoise, so against Zeno's paradox, and gives Achilles the following statement. So statement A is that things that are equal to the same are equal to each other. B is the two sides of this triangle are equal to the same. And the statement Z, because I'm Canadian, the two sides of this triangle are equal to each other. So if you accept that A and B are true, what can you say about Z? I think quite naturally, we see that if things that are equal to the same are equal to each other, and these two things are equal to the same, it means that those two things are equal to each other. So we're saying if A and B are both true, then D, Z is also true, I think is what, what all of us will naturally, um, will naturally come to. But this is not necessarily what the, the tortoise wants to talk to Euclid, or Achilles, Achilles about, goodness. Um, the tortoise agrees with Achilles that Z follows from A and B. So they're, they're in agreement there. But for the sake of argument, the tortoise also asks if there may be someone who accepts that A and B are true, but does not accept that Z is true. And for the sake of argument, the tortoise decides to be this person. Um, the tortoise asks Achilles to convince him using logic that Z is true. So these were the original statements. And again, what's happening is the tortoise is saying that um, he will accept that A and B are true, but will not accept that Z is also true. So the Achilles. So Achilles asks the tortoise to accept C, which says that if A and B are true, then Z must be true. The tortoise accepts C, so the tortoise now accepts A, B, and C, but is still refusing to accept Z. So the Achilles now asks the tortoise to accept the statement D. If A, B, and C are true, then Z must also be true. And again, the tortoise accepts this statement, 
So now A, B, C, and D, this, the tortoise has all accepted these, but is still rejecting Z, that the conclusion here is true. And so the list of premises grows and grows. So I have now labeled them with numbers because I would run out of letters. Um, so the premises are uh, such as one and two implies Z, one and two and three implies Z, up to one and two to N minus one implies Z. And Achilles is now stuck in this infinite list of premises because the tortoise will keep accepting the, the numbered premises as true, but won't accept Z to be true. So what's kind of happening here is that um, Lewis Carroll is showing that modus ponens, so modus ponens is the rule that um, P implies Q and P, if both of those are true, therefore P, Q is true. I'm sorry, I couldn't write that on the, on the screen to remind you all of modus ponens, but hopefully it's something that is not too unfamiliar. So again, if, if P implies Q and P is true, then Q also has to be true. This is, this is one of the rules of inference that I actually was like teaching my students a few, few weeks ago, um, or they were learning it as a rule of inference. Um, so by, by this example with Achilles and the tortoise, Carol is showing that modus ponens needs to be a rule of inference that's defined within the system of logic, because if it's not a rule, which is what the tortoise is saying, this one, two implying Z, that's modus ponens and the tortoise is refusing to accept modus ponens. So if it's not a rule, then justifying modus ponens requires other principles to be justified, which is what Achilles is trying to do. The tortoise isn't accepting those rules of logic um, and is asking for a proof of the rule. And giving the proof of the rule is where, where the problem lies and where we have this infinite um, list of premises. And it's also a problem because the tortoise and Achilles are not agreeing on the definition of implication. So it's, it's really saying that we need to have these rules. And if we don't have these rules of inference, uh, weird things can, can happen. Okay, so we have completed our caucus race and our race with Achilles and the tortoise. Um, and Alice hears the mouse's story and she finally catches up with the white rabbit. Um, she changes size again by eating a cake. She finds herself wandering around a wood until she comes across a very large caterpillar on top of a very large mushroom. So Alice has gotten very tired of changing sizes as she travels through Wonderland. She complains to the caterpillar about not knowing who she is anymore because she's been changing so much. And as Alice says, and being so many different sizes in a day is very confusing. The caterpillar is not very sympathetic to Alice's plight, which annoys Alice. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll quote directly from the book here. As the caterpillar seemed to be in a very unpleasant state of mind, she turned away. Come back, the caterpillar called after her. I have something important to say. This sounded promising, certainly. Alice turned and came back again. Keep your temper, said the caterpillar. Is that all? Said Alice, swallowing down her anger as well as she could. So the caterpillar says to Alice, keep your temper. Alice completely reasonably interprets that the caterpillar is telling her not to get angry. But there is in fact a different definition of the word temp temper, which is archaic. It is from the 14th century is what I was able to discern. It was hard to find this information. Um, so this archaic 14th century definition of the word temper um, show, saying that it's uh, a proportion uh, quantities um, or middle state of being between extremes, uh, from this, it could be that the caterpillar is instead telling Alice to keep her body in proportion. This is another version of the word temper. And as we mentioned in our introduction, um, Dodson really, really was a very big fan of Euclid. In my notes, I've written like capital V, capital B, capital F for very big fan of Euclid and his geometry, just like really, really loved Euclid. He wrote that whole play about it. Um, so Euclid's geometry assumes a small set of axioms and deducing many other propositions from those axioms. Um, I'm not sure this is like a side note. I'm not sure if other people here have ever played Euclid the game, um, but it's really fun. 
Um, it's still existing on the internet. Um, I think I found out about it when I was an undergrad, so it's been around for a while. Um, but you start out knowing very few things and being able to do very, very few things in Euclid the game. And then you eventually use the axioms to build all of these other geometric things that you can do. If you haven't played this game, I really, uh, really do encourage you to check it out because it's so fun. Um, so yeah, in Euclid's geometry, we just have a few axioms. Thank you, BK. I was like, someone will have a link ready. Um, we have a few axioms and then we manage to discern other things. And more importantly, in Euclidean geometry, there are no coordinates and magnitude doesn't matter. But what does matter is ratios and proportions. So the proportion matters of what things are going on in Euclidean geometry, but also if temper means keeping a proportion, this carefully chosen line from the caterpillar could be a reference to Dawson's love of Euclid in that the caterpillar is telling Alice that no matter how much you, si you change your size, you want to make sure that your proportions stay as they are. Um, this mathematical reference might seem a bit tenuous to you. It seems a bit more tenuous than some of the other ones to me too. Um, but if you uh, are a bit skeptical about this one, I have another one from this chapter that is more explicit. Um, so again, I will read directly from, um, from a quote from the book. So then the caterpillar got down off the mushroom and crawled away in the grass, merely remarking as it went, one side will make you grow taller and the other side will make you grow shorter. One side of what? The other side of what? Thought Alice to herself. Of the mushroom, said the caterpillar, just as if she had asked it aloud. And in another moment, it was out of sight. Alice remained looking thoughtfully at the mushroom for a minute, trying to make out which were the two sides of it. And as it was perfectly round, she found it a very difficult question. So I just like that little geometry bit. <laughs> okay, so Alice has got these pieces of mushroom that she keeps in her pocket for quite some time, actually and uses it just to, to keep changing sizes. Um, so she plays around with the sides of the mushroom with an unfortunate moment of her neck growing so much that she scares a bird in a tree who thinks that she's a serpent. So she was not able to keep her temper. Um, her proportions changed entirely. Um, and she hasn't argumented with the, with the bird about whether or not she's a serpent, which is another logical excursion. Um, but eventually she gets back to her normal size again. Then she sees a house that's about four feet high and realizes that she's too big for this house. So she decides to shrink herself back down to nine inches to pay the residents a visit. She finds herself in a kitchen full of smoke with a duchess nursing a sneezing, screaming baby and a cook pouring pepper into a cauldron of soup. After some violence in the kitchen, the duchess tosses the baby to Alice and goes off to get ready for croquet with the queen. As Alex struggles to hold the squirming baby, she eventually figures out the effective way to hold it, which again, this is a quote, uh, which was to twist it up into a sort of knot and then keep tight hold of its right ear and its left foot so as to prevent it undoing itself, which to me, this is not something that people on the internet have talked about when they talk about the math analysis in Wonderland. Um, but this sounds a lot to me like a Mobius strip. We're taking, we're having some kind of knot and we have like, right ear and left foot feels very much like our twist. Um, that aside, she brings the child outside and it stops sneezing and it begins to grunt. As Alice looks at the grunting baby, she notices that it had a very turn up nose, more like a snout than a real nose. And also its eyes were getting extremely small for a baby. Eventually the baby grunts so violently that as Alice looks down, she concludes that the baby is almost certainly a pig. So it was a human baby at one point and transforms into a pig. So projective geometry is a branch of mathematics having to do with, as the name suggests, the geometry of projecting things. It looks at the relationships um, between geometric figures and images that result from projecting them onto another surface. And projective geometry, as a lot of us might already be be familiar with some non-intuitive things happen when compared to our usual geometric world that like the 3D world that we exist in, um, such as the fact that two parallel lines in the projective plane meet at a point in infinity. Not an intuitive thing if you are in our current realm and not in the realm of projective geometry. So the principle of continuity says that properties that hold for one figure are also true for figures formed from the original by a continuous transformation. 
So this was explicitly stated by Pomace in the 1822 Treatise on Protective Geometry that was at the very beginning of our timeline several slides ago. And the principle of continuity, for example, says that if we have these two circles that intersect in two points and we move the second circle in order to separate them, that these transformed circles also meet in two points because the property beforehand was that they met at two points. So now they must still have that property because we had a continuous transformation. But these two trans, so they're still meeting in two points, but it doesn't look like it to us here. So these are imaginary points this time. When Polisay talks of figures in, in this rule about um, continuity, he means in the geometric sense, like geometric objects. Um, but one could argue that um, Dodgson or Carroll chooses to interpret this as person's shape definition of figure through his description of the transformation of the baby into a pig. So if you think about it, what happened was we had this baby and then Alice was noticing some things happen with the baby and eventually we ended up with a pig. So the baby undergoes a continuous transformation to turn into the pig. Alice sees the nose changing, sees the eyes changing, and it seems to retain some of the features. There's a reference to it, it sprawling and things like that. But many properties of the baby are lost when it becomes a pig. They are two different objects. <laughs> I think most of us would agree that a pig and a baby are not exactly the same unless it is a baby pig, but that is not what we're talking about here. Human baby, baby pig. Um, so this transformation could be, I was expecting someone to say that it depends on the baby, so thank you. <laughs> um, this transformation could be a commentary on how absurd um, uh, Dodgson found the idea of continuous transformation um, in projective geometry to be. Although at the end, when, when it has, the baby has become truly a pig, um, Alice does conclude that as the pig runs off, if it had grown up, uh, if it had grown up, I think it would have made a dreadfully ugly child, but it makes a rather handsome pig, I think. So maybe Carol deep down thought projective geometry had some handsome qualities too. Um, so we have this continuous transformation from baby to pig, commentary on projective geometry of the time slightly before Lewis Carroll. So after the incident with the pig, Alice encounters the Cheshire cat who tells her where to go to visit the Mad Hatter and the March Hare. She arrives in that place to find a table set for far more guests than just the Hatter, Hare, and the Dormouse. After some introductions and frustration, I'll again give a direct reading from part of the book. All the Hatter said was, why is a raven like a writing desk? Come, we shall have fun now, thought Alice. I'm glad they've begun asking riddles. I believe I can guess that, she added aloud. Do you mean that you think you can find the answer to it? Said the March Hare. Exactly so, said Alice. Then you should say what you mean, the March Hare went on. I do, Alice hastily replied. At least, at least I mean what I say. That's the same thing, you know. Not the same thing a bit, said the Hatter. You might as just you might as well just say that I see what I eat is the same thing as I eat what I see. You might as well say, added the March chair, that I like what I get is the same thing as I get what I like. You might as well say, added the dormouse, who seemed to be talking in his sleep, that I breathe when I sleep is the same thing as I sleep when I breathe. These comments from the Hatter, Hare, and Dormouse hint at the idea of non non-commutativity, which is one of the interesting properties about quaternions. So quaternions are a number system that extend the complex number system. Um, they're generally represented in the form A plus BI plus CJ plus DK, where A, B, C, and D are real numbers, and I, J, K are the basic quaternions that have the property that I squared plus J squared plus K squared equals I, J, K equals negative one. That's how we know the quaternions to be when we're when we're defining them. Um, quaternions have a lot of applications in physics, which I think is actually my um, primary experience with the quaternions. I did a, a physics undergrad as well as math, um, but they have nice algebraic properties like being a vector space over the real numbers and forming a non-commutative associate algebra over R. So they're a nice example if you're looking for something that's non-commutative. So if we think back to the timeline that I gave to you a while back ago, um, in 1843, William Rowan Hamilton discovered quaternions and their non-commutativity. 
Hamilton was trying to make things work um, with only three terms because he was very naturally thinking that um, he would need three terms, one for each dimension of space as we know our space to be. Um, but by adding the fourth dimension, he got the 3D rotations he was looking for. So when he, he only had three terms, all of his rotations were stuck in a plane. He couldn't escape from the plane and, and go into the third dimension for being able to rotate objects. And once he added that fourth term, he was able to get the rotations he was looking for. So he had difficulty understanding what this fourth term represented, and he assumed that it had to mean something. Um, he wrote in his lectures on quaternions, it seemed and still seems to me natural to connect this extra spatial unit with the concept of time. So what I haven't mentioned with, and, and in fact, this is like something in, in physics, very much thinking of that fourth dimension when um, doing relativistic physics, we are looking at three dimensions of space and one dimension of time is mostly how I remember things from my modern, my modern physics class where I was learning relativity. Um, so what I haven't mentioned yet is that uh, in the tea party is that the, the Mad Hatter actually mentions the character of time in the story. Um, they make reference um, to time not cooperating and Alice actually says something about um, beating time and the Hatter said that um, when, when she's counting music that she has to beat the time um, and the Hatter says that that's why time doesn't want to talk to you. <laughs> like it won't do what you ask it to because you, you beat him, um, which is just a little bit more darker in the in the uh, Victorian era stories for children than we might see in in things today. Um, but what the Hatter also mentions of time is that the two of them had a falling out, um, and now it's all way six o'clock, which is time for tea. So time is no longer involved here, and it is just the same time all the time. And so the characters no longer have the time to wash things between tea times since it's just a constant state of being that it's always tea. And so the characters instead, as you might recall, if you've been familiar with the story, and I'm sure that this is like a scene in the 1951 version that I know most people are familiar with, but I am not <laughs> very, um, there's the big table and they rotate around the table so that um, they get new clean things as they go around the table. Um, Alice does question what happens when you get back to the start and they just kind of ignore her. Um, but they they have to rotate around the table set for more people than needed in order to get clean tea things. So here we have the Hatter, the Hare, and the Dormouse, which are three characters that are stuck rotating in a plane without the fourth character of time. We know that time's not there. So it really seems like our Tea Party friends represent the three first three terms of a quaternion, which Hamilton was struggling with for so long. And again, when, when Hamilton only had three terms of a quaternion, he was stuck rotating in a plane. And then when he added that fourth dimension that he considered to be time, it allowed them another degree of freedom of movement. And without time, they'll never get to leave this table. So I found this one really interesting. Um, it does seem in some ways like a little bit far-fetched, but in other ways, it seems just too perfect to not actually be intentional. Um, that, that the elimination of time is what's forcing these characters to be stuck, stuck within a plane. They can't leave their plane. So, so I have a historical question. Um, yeah. So, I might not have an answer, but go ahead. <laughs> so when Hamilton was, uh, was working on this, right? So you know, wanted to do it with three and needed four. Um, like the fourth one, is that, is that like K or is the fourth one one? I assume that the fourth one is K because it's an extension of the complex numbers. So the complex numbers would have just been, and this is actually another argument that I saw was that at the, at the end of, um, at the end of the tea party when Alice leaves, the March Hare and the, um, the Hatter actually like trying to force the Dormouse into a, um, into a teapot unclear why but um one could argue that by trying to get rid of the third term they now just are I'm not sure if you can see my pointer or not um but they they're now just with that a plus b i term and now all of a sudden they're free to move within at least two dimensions they can move anywhere because they're just complex numbers so I think I think that fourth piece is the k um but I have not done enough research to my my research mathematically has been very cursory in order to talk about so many things, but my my expectation is probably that it's K. I'm not sure if anyone else is more familiar with the history of quaternions to pipe in. Okay, well, so the, the reason that I was thinking that right is that um, so so if you wanted to make one of these time, 
right? It should be the one that has it like that's different from the other three, mm -hmm. right? And so if you, I mean, in terms of like the Minkowski metric, right? Like I squared, J squared, K squared, each minus one. And yeah. then one squared is one. So it's like different. So anyway, I, I'm, I, I'm sure my, my, my question was sort of like about Hamilton thinking, but yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure of what Hamilton's thinking. And my expectation just by the fact that this is an extension of the complex numbers is that it was the K, which is what Hamilton was missing, that he was just working with I and J and not the K. Um, but I do not know that for sure. Um, and if anyone does know, um, please, please feel free to contribute. Thanks for the question. Um, I actually, I think this is the, the end of some of the mathematical stuff and now we just get to finish the story. Um, so Alice begins to get a little frustrated at the nonsense of the tea party and leaves in a huff. She ends up finding a door in a tree and finds herself in a beautiful garden where some cards are painting a rose bush. The king and queen of hearts arrive and the queen insists on a lot of people losing their heads. Alice is invited to play croquet the, with the queen and does so. And then there's a bit of a diversion with a mock turtle. Um, and I'm always very unclear on how that actually happens. <laughs> it's very, very random. And I think it's not in a lot of uh, adaptations because it just seems such a diversion. Um, so after this, excursion with the mock turtle. Um, the name of hearts is put on trial for stealing some charts belonging to the queen. Alice begins changing size again while in the courtroom and then is called forward as a witness. The trial becomes less and less logical and Alice eventually returns to her proper size. After the queen orders Alice's head off, Alice responds, who cares for you? You're nothing but a pack of cards. And the cards attacked as shown here. Um, but then Alice wakes up again on the bank with her sister. And that's the end of the story. Um, of course, in Through the Looking Glass, there are many more references and many chess references that are of interest. Um, but that's the end of what I wanted to talk to you about today. I have a final slide with references and I am happy to, now that I have nothing left to reveal, <laughs> give a link to the slides if you're interested in finding any of those links like the, um, the Hello Kitty version of Alice in Wonderland or some of uh, the writings of Lewis Carroll or Charles Dodson or some of the things that I use to uh, as references for this talk. So thank you for your time and attention. So I had a question along the way. Would readers at the time have known that Carroll was in another life a mathematician? That's a great question. Um, I do not know how much he, like there's certain authors who like keep their pen name selves and their actual self very, very separate. Um, I imagine, I don't know if it was like public knowledge um, that uh, Carol and um, Dodson were the same person or not. Um, I do know that the way that he got his pen name was based on his name. He like translated his um, Charles Ludwig to um, Latin and then like switched the order and made a new version of it back in English in order to get Lewis Carroll. Um, so that's um, that's how he ended up with the name. So it's not like it was a like really, really far thing from what his actual name was. Um, and yeah, the there I, I'm not sure historically how much he had done that. But I know that there were like a lot of references in this that would have been very funny to a Victorian audience that maybe don't like sit well with us now, 150 years later. Um, but the mathematical references, I'm not sure so much if it would be something that people would have been looking for at the time because I'm not certain whether they knew um, that the author was in fact a mathematician. I'll also say that like, it wasn't like, Dodgson was a huge name mathematician in the mathematical field. He did have several books, but he he didn't, I don't know if he like really, I think he really was just a lecturer. I don't know how much he was actually doing in, um, in research. I know he didn't do any studies beyond his undergraduate. He just like got an undergrad and then was made a lecturer for 25 pounds for life and just, you know, did that because why wouldn't you? At the time. You know, that's how the job market works. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like my senior colleagues in, in the past who were like, I just got a letter one day and I had tenure. <laughs>
Yeah, it happened to my dad. So Joel, you want to explain your your comment about thinking he's the dodo? Oh, just uh, I think there's a dodo at some point. As Mita will know at which point in the story the dodo character comes in, but I think some people have interpreted Dodgson as as dodo in yeah. that uh, menagerie. Yeah, they that has definitely been like a point that is there. The dodo is um, at the caucus race. So the dodo is the one who is commanding the caucus race. Um, but yes, that is thought. Um, I'm not sure exactly like where the link is besides the name being similar of Dodge and, and Dodo, but um, it is thought that a link between like Lewis Carroll might've put himself or Charles Dawson put himself in the story as the dodo. <laughs> uh, Isabella asks, uh, thank you for an excellent talk. I'm curious, how did you come up with the idea for the discussion today? So creative. And maybe a piece of that is that the first version of this talk was for outreach for kids. So like what, can you tell us about how, how, how you came to talking about this publicly? Yeah, so um, this was actually like my very first outreach talk. Um, I ended up working, like I think I've done four or five now <laughs> outreach talks for Nova Scotia Math Circles, um, but I gave this talk in, or a version of this talk. I didn't talk about projective geometry in that one. Um, I gave a version of this talk in 2017, so that was during my second year of my PhD, and I was just like looking for an interesting thing, and I think actually what inspired the talk was this book. Um, I gave my talk in 2017 and my dad was sent this book from his brother in the summer of 2016. So this book was just like lying around my house um, because Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was like, I think very important to both, to like my dad growing up as well and presumably his brother, my, my dad and my uncle um, were born in England. Um, and so I think they were just kind of like surrounded by this, especially as, um, young boys and my dad being a young boy interested in mathematics um so this book was just around and I might have even asked my dad for ideas and he might have mentioned this to me but I do think I like came up with the idea myself <laughs> but I think it was really this book that kind of inspired me um inspired me to to take a look at Alice as my first kind of like outreach talk I wanted to do something a bit different um and no one around had done a literature talk and children's literature is like very near and dear to my heart so um, I love having nieces because I get to discover all the new, the new books for children. So it's great. There's some really great science books for kids out there. Do you know the, the, it looks like a chapter uh, called something like a hyperbolic tea party where Alice returns to the tea party and the tea is a literal like perpendicular sign T. Mm -hmm. not a cup of tea and and they keep it's sort of the same style of dialogue where she sort of comments about how the teas are all different sizes and how they don't all look like the same and and, and they're like no they are the same and they're sort of like it's somebody has picked this up and is just like straight up explaining hyperbolic geometry using the tea party that. That's that's great. So my I, I will confess there's a lot of me talking trying to talk about geometry in this talk. I have like no background in geometry whatsoever. I went to an undergrad university that like doesn't have any geometry courses. So my geometry background is um very weak. Um yeah. <laughs> I did take differential and algebraic, but like just typical geometry, I'm hopeless at it. <laughs> I'm an algebraic geometer and I hadn't taken geometry since middle school before I took uh, differential geometry in grad school. No, my, I, with like math competitions, I actually like, I'm on a, I'm on a contest committee and we have a meeting this weekend. So that's another thing I have coming up, but um, I was working through like 80 math competition problems on Monday and I just skipped a lot of the geometry ones because I was like, I'm not going to get it. You should just sign up to teach it, right? That's, that's how I learned all of, I mean, really really gratifying actually to like oh yeah that's how this works um that sign an ex, uh, you know sign up to teach an axiomatic geometry class it's interesting maybe one day i will do that right now i'm still at the stage of the career where like i'm really just teach first year courses so one day <laughs> i think we have time for maybe one more question if anybody has something yeah i have a question so on the topic of uh, continuity, 
you talked about it with circles, but it, it makes me think that when Alice shrinks at the beginning and still isn't sure if she's herself, that the same question comes up. That's a good point of all of these changes because it is like all of Alice's transformations are continuous transformations. So that's another really good point. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. I don't, you know, it's, I guess, yeah, sounds like more of a comment now that I say it, but thanks. <laughs> That's okay. No, I like looking at like, there. there's a lot of people who have already talked about some of the things that they found. And that's what I, I mostly talked about here was nothing that I was able to see in the book myself, but I did make that point about the Mobius strip and the pig. Um, like that, the description of how to hold the pig just really reminded me of constructing Mobius strips. Um, but that's another really great observation that maybe we can interpret it in that way. And this is again, what I'm saying about like literary analysis, like what did the author intend? We don't actually know. So maybe this was the whole thing. Maybe this entire book is a comment on projective geometry and continuous transformation, perhaps. I said in the chat, but I would love on either episode of Doctor Who or a real life episode of Doctor Who, where you get to go back and uh, hang out with us and uh, and ask ask the literary analysis questions from a modern geometry perspective. <laughs> I would love to be able to do that. <laughs> All right, in our last minute, I will. I'm gonna take the share so that I can display next mm -hmm. week's uh, work uh, or. Abstract. So next week we have Priyam Patel, uh, who's going to be talking about how to find research projects and collaborators, which I think will be uh, really fun. Um, and while the surface level it seems a little bit different, I think the sort of strong connection with this talk about like, you know, making connections and looking for ideas and and sort of being asking what kinds of questions people are interested in and what they're seeing. So I think it'll be a very different direction, but a similar ethos from some of the things we, we heard about this week, which is lovely. Um, and then let us uh, return to this week and please everyone join me uh, in thanking Asmita for an excellent talk today. Yay. Thanks everyone. Oh, yay. <laughs>